Hey, Ratiba, brother, I see you. How are you? You are muted, so you would have to unmute your mic. Um, I'm good, and how are you? I'm doing fantastic. I hope you're doing great. I'm doing very well. Beautiful, beautiful. So good to have you here. Uh, Maliha, I see you. Thanks for joining in. Ngoni, thanks for joining in. Uh, it promises to be an interesting conversation today, and I cannot wait for it to get started. Uh, Maliha, Ngoni, please unmute your mic and say hello. Hello, Davis. Hello, Hi. Rebecca. And Hi. everybody, hello. Hi, Maliha. It's good to hear Hi. you. How are you doing today? Not bad. You all okay, too? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm doing great, and I'm super excited about the conversation we're about to have. Me too, me too. And it's a good way to have this, uh, so we're all safe. So thank you for arranging it. Definitely, definitely. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you for, for joining you're welcome. in very early. Ngoni, I, you're here. Can you hear me? Hello, Ngoni. Okay, so uh, Rativa, you were you were part of the conversation last month. Uh, uh, so for for Maliha and a few other people that are going to be joining in uh, very soon, that are you know joining us for the first time, uh, what what are your thoughts, uh, your perspectives from from uh, the conversation that we had last month? Your feedback, give us an idea. Um. The conversation we had the previous time, I think it was, you know, um, very needed. And as, as also like it was an introduction to the conversation that we're going to have, you know, we touched base on um, a lot of, lot of why we're doing certain things in communities and how we can better, you know, coming up with the solutions and making sure that they're implemented and also trying to look at um, the government, you know, uh, policies that are supporting those structures, how can we get support also from, you know, the, the structures and all that. So I think for me, the, from then to now, there's a lot of progress in my, in my space. So there's a lot of implementations that are going to be happening as well. I'll share maybe some of the things that I've got into throughout since we had a conversation as well. Fantastic. Fantastic, Ratiba. And by the way, just for, for context, uh, last month, which was the very first edition of this conversation, uh, we talked about how um, Africans, uh, we as African, young African leaders can, you know, uh, pay forward the things that we have learned uh, to other Africans that have not had the opportunities that we've had. Because, uh, uh, and by the way, I, I see Sukes joining in, I see Sean joining in, you're welcome, guys. Um, so I was saying, uh, you know, for a lot of us, whether we choose to admit it or not, we actually have, have gotten certain privileges. It is even the way, it, it is what is responsible for the fact that we're even connected at this level. It's that we've been exposed to certain things. We've been a part of certain conversations. We've been in certain environments that have afforded us the opportunity to have, you know, uh, to be visible across the continent and across the world. And there are millions of other young Africans like us who are, you know, looking for opportunities to be able to do things that are very similar to the things that we do. And so last month's conversation was focused around, you know, uh, how can we who have had those opportunities pay forward, you know, uh, the things that we've learned to other people. And it was, it was a really interesting conversation. So although there was just about eight of us from about, you know, five different countries, but it was really good. But today, uh, I'm super excited to, to have a whole lot, of, you know, uh, there should be about 20 to 25 of us today. And uh, last I counted, we were from 10 different countries, which is really good. So, uh, Sikes, you're here. Tell us, uh, uh, how is Malawi today? You have to unmute your mic first. Gift, you have to unmute your mic first. You have to unmute your mic. Your mic. You're muted. D. Great. Okay. Cup of water. Half a cup of uh, um, milk. Put majani. It's in that small <laughs> Malia is Malia is buying milk. <laughs> uh, um. So, Sukes, I still cannot hear you. Uh, I still cannot hear you. 
you later, sir. Make it. Okay, there are a few more people joining in. Um, Gift, can you try again? No, I still cannot hear you. Uh oh. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yes, I can hear you, Charles. Charles, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Adil Osman, Hi. I see you. You're welcome. Uh, Adam, I see you. Welcome, 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 guys. Welcome, guys. Welcome, one, welcome, all. Um, it, it promises to be a very, very interesting time. I'm getting goosebumps already. Super excited. Um, uh, Suitcase, can you check again for your audio? Oh no, man! We can't. We we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Charles. What city in Lagos are you in? In Nigeria, are you in? Uh, I live in Lagos, but I'm currently in Abuja now because I had some things to do in Abuja, so that's why I told you I was. Oh, um, fantastic! Fantastic! Out of it's, town, yes. It's it's good to have you join us, uh, Hadil. How are you doing today? How's Sudan today? Hi. Um, it's good. It's hot. We. I might be losing electricity at any point um, it, this evening. So. It's all right. Uh, your, your face is bright enough. We're just going to enjoy it that way. Um, so I see Nkosana. Nkosana is joining us. Nkosana, how are you doing today? Hey, brother. How are you? How is everyone? I'm doing awesome. I'm doing awesome. Thank you for tuning in. And guys, I really want to celebrate every single one of us for joining in early. I see uh, my Ngoni is joining in. Uh, quite a number of people. Uh, I'm trying to ensure that I acknowledge everyone. Uh, but the conversation is going to start effectively in two minutes. Um, in two minutes, it's going to be 4 p.m. West African time. And we are going to begin the conversation. And today, uh, we're going to be focusing on, you know, the barriers that exist, you know, in terms of expanding our operations. You know, every single person in this conversation is a social innovator. We are all, you know, either running businesses or running social enterprises or developing or working on one innovation or the other uh, in different countries in Africa. And uh, I, I see that, you know, for a lot of us, there are opportunities in other areas of the continent. So we're, we're looking at how we can break down these barriers to these opportunities and effectively leverage them. Adam, I can see you. Can you hear me, Adam? Okay, I tried to get my mic. I don't know. Oh, yeah, if... Sukes, I can hear you now. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> okay then I'll just use the headphones. Awesome, that works. How is, how's Malawi today? Uh, Malawi is good. Malawi is good. The weather is so cold now because uh, it's, yeah, June is mostly cold season. So, yeah. It's but everything, I think, is fine. Working from home, uh, not much of movement. So, yeah, but everything is fine. Okay, that, that is really good. So, it is hot in Sudan, it is cold in Malawi. Welcome to yeah. the University <laughs> of Africa. Um, Zamir, I see you. How are you doing today? Oh, okay, Zamir is still trying to connect his headphone. Um, Natalie, I see you. Good, good. How are you doing today? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks for joining in. Uh, Natalie, you're, you're joining us from Uganda, am I correct? Yes, Kampala. Uh, how is Kampala, Uganda doing today? It's a very bright, beautiful day here. Awesome. Awesome. That is so good. All right, guys. So it is effectively 4 p.m. West African time. We want to be very, very time conscious. And uh, this conversation is meant to last for two hours. So we want to ensure that we maximize the use of time effectively. So let me take this opportunity to officially welcome every single one of you, uh, social innovators across the continent of Africa, to the African Core. Now, the African Core is a, is a conversation series that was inspired primarily by the need to foster conversation uh, between innovators across the continent, because there are a lot of us spread around this amazing continent of Africa doing incredibly amazing things. But while we only get to read about ourselves, you know, on Forbes, on Bloomberg, watch ourselves on CNN, and there is, we do not have as, I, I personally feel that we do not have as much of a connectedness uh, that can help enhance the things that we're doing. And that is one of the reasons why we said, let's create this platform, let's bring dialogue amongst 
social innovators on the continent and emerging leaders so that we can learn from each other and uh, we can advance you know the collective course of every single one of us so that is the basic idea about around the african coin thank you guys all for being here so today uh like i said we just have two hours so we want to ensure that we maximize the use of time as quickly as possible uh, as best as we can so um, very quickly just after i'm done with these introductions i'm going to invite every single person to introduce themselves and your introduction should typically not be more than 30 seconds you know all right 30 seconds and in 30 seconds uh i would like you to tell us just your first name uh your country where you're dialing in from uh what you do and uh if you if you have operations in more than one african country right so that would be the format of the introduction your first name your country what you do and how many african countries you operate in um so uh that said before i go into the introductions i want to make a very important point that would you know serve as the as the base of the conversation we're having today africa is driven by relationships africa is driven by relationships think about it in politics think about it in business if you look at the biggest businesses on the continent think about it in every single dimension that you can you would see the huge role that relationships play in the advancement of the things that we see on the continent to be huge and big already whatever they might be in media conglomerates big organizations it is driven by relationships and i strongly believe that as we continue to have conversations and foster relationships amongst ourselves, not only will we advance our personal cause, but also advance the cost of the continent. And with that, I'd like to say welcome to every single person. So introductions now, I'm just gonna acknowledge you. Once I acknowledge you, unmute your mic, show us your face and activate video. Then uh, tell us your first name, your country, uh, what you do and how many countries you operate in. Suke is your first on my screen, so you go first. Okay, um, my name is Gift Sukali, uh, coming from Malawi. Um, I'm the founder and uh, CEO at HD Bus Creations, which, which is a media company mostly to do with our media, Kozara CPR, uh, filming, as well as uh, photography. Uh, currently, we're operating for Malawi and South Africa. Uh, South Africa is just a new branch, which we it's not like fully there but we have a branch there like there are only two people as of now and we're trying to expand to zambia as well currently uh we're employing uh my fellow 18 people right now uh under the company fantastic thank you very much gift thank you for joining us charles you're next okay my name is charles i run a technology and communication agency we are operating in nigeria ghana kenya and rwanda um, I currently operate out of Lagos. Um, we're about 30 teams strong across Nigeria and also across the other African country, about 52 teams strong. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much, uh, Charles, for joining us. Uh, Zamir, you're up next. Hello, Zamir. Can you hear me? Uh, you have to unmute your mic and then introduce yourself. Okay, so I'm not sure if Zamir can hear me, so we'll probably come back to Zamir. Uh, Natalie, uh, Natalie, can you hear me? Introduce yourself, please. Sure. Hi, I'm Natalie from Uganda. I, I work as the chief of staff for Simba Group of Companies, which operates in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. And I'm also a social entrepreneur. My personal three businesses, two of them operate in Uganda and one is online. So we have women from about 10 to 12 African countries. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very much for joining us, Natalie. Terry, you are up next. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Terence, Terence Mate. I run a waste management business in Zimbabwe. Uh, so currently we operate from Zimbabwe and Zambia. And yeah, that's me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Terence, for joining us. Zamir, can you hear me now? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, my 
my name is Zamir Veji from Kenya. I run an architectural and construction company. Um, I'm based in uh, four countries on on region, and uh, we hope to keep growing. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much for joining us, Zamir. Nkosana, you're up next. Hey, Sam. Uh, my name is Nkosana Chachma Visa. I'm a social entrepreneur based in Zim. Uh, I run a brand strategy consultancy firm that is operating in Zim in SA and parts of uh, Botswana. I also own an incubation center. This is where I am. It's based in, in Bulawayo. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nkosana, for joining us. Sean, you're up next. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. All right, excellent. Hi, guys. My name is Shoriwa Shwan Benjamin. I run a technology firm that's based in Zimbabwe, South Africa. We make mobile applications and software solutions. I also started a startup uh, a few months ago called Learnable, which is basically a sort of like a social startup that uh, teaches underprivileged children through interactive uh, lessons via WhatsApp and via uh, mobile application. Fantastic, thank you very much for joining us, Sean. Um, I Create Africa, I see you. Introduce yourself, please. So, Bright, Bright Jaja, can you hear me? So introduce yourself, please. Um, hi everyone, my name is Bright Jaja. I'm the CEO of my father like in Africa. Sorry, I had to change that real quick. Um, and I basically run a, a company that is focused on promoting technical and vocational skilled trades. Um, basically, our job is to position technical and vocational skilled workers to get job opportunities. And we just recently launched our digital platform, which is a digital marketplace for skilled workers. Um, and they were building a strong ecosystem in Nigeria and across Africa. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Bright, for joining us. And for those that are just joining us, remember when you introduce yourself, your first name, the country you operate from, uh, the countries that you operate in in Africa, and uh, uh, tell us the industry that you that you play in. Um, so, uh, Hadil, Hadil, you're up next. Hello, everyone. My name is Hadil. I'm from Sudan. Um, I run a creative uh, studio. We uh, basically are based in Khartoum, but we also offer consultancy across uh, Africa, and most of our work has to do with creative direction. Fantastic, thank you very much for joining, on, for joining us, Adil. Josh, Josh Okmata, you're up next. Hey guys, it's a pleasure to join in. My name is Josh, um, I work in Azure Capital um, with a company called Mass. We train, fund entrepreneurs across, five Afri across all of Africa, but we have uh, markets, operations in five cities, Abidjan, um, Cape Town, Nairobi, Accra, and Lagos. Um, I guess that's all I was going to say. Pleasure. Fantastic. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Josh. Uh, Ray, Ray Itumaleng, can you hear me? Okay, uh, so while we wait for Ray, Maliha, could you please introduce yourself? Um, Maliha. Hi everybody, my name is Maliha. Um, I'm uh, from Nairobi in Kenya and uh, I have uh, two businesses that I'm very proud of. One is in education, I deal with children who have learning disabilities and the other one is a very small creative enterprise. Um, I am a henna artist. I don't know if anyone of you know what henna is, but it's something for beautification, it's therapeutic, it's something nice. Really, really good. Uh, nice to meet you all. Yeah, same here, buddy. Same here. Um, yeah. Adam, Adam, are you with us? Can you hear us? Introduce yourself, please. Yes. Adam, we need to see your face. Hi, everyone. So I'm Adam. I'm also from Kotonou in Benin. I run a company. We are based in eight countries in around Africa. So that would be five in Africa and three outside of Africa. And it's a logistic company. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Adam. Let's see. Ratiba, you're up next. Hi, everyone. My name is Ratiba Mohali. 
I'm from South Africa. I'm, I work in marketing and I do a lot of um, working with organizations to you know, solve solutions in society. So I'm only based in South Africa. So nice to meet everyone. Thank you very much for joining us, Ratiba. Um, who's here next? Uh, Mai, Mai Ngoni. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Mai, can you hear me? Okay, so while we wait for Mai, uh, let's take uh, Ngoni. So we have Ngoni as well. Ngoni, can you hear me? Okay, so that, that doesn't seem to be working. Pinky, Pinky Mankele. Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Pinky Mangele. I'm from South Africa. I am into the health sector and um, I am the communications director of TEDx Gresham Place. Um, and yeah, I'm into leadership and development. Thank you. And we operate in South Africa. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Pinky, for joining in. Um, is there anyone else that I haven't, that hasn't introduced themselves? Uh, of everyone. Please, if you have not introduced yourself, you can feel free to unmute your mic right now. I will take your introductions and then we'll move into the core of the conversation. Okay, um, so we do not have any further introductions. All right, guys, so let's, let's delve into the, into the core of the conversation. Now, this is the model that we are going to follow. So uh, I would begin the process. I'll kickstart the process by uh, posing a question. And then um, once I pose the question, if you'd like to respond uh, to that question, except in cases where I specifically address the questions based on some of the things that I know about uh, some of you that are joining in. But, you know, um, if I did not specifically address the question to a particular person, you could just uh, raise your hand if you'd like to make a contribution on that question. But here is the simple guiding, you know, uh, principle that we're going to have for today. As you make your contributions, please ensure that you keep your contributions to under two minutes. So for every contribution that you make, for every time that you acknowledge and you're taking the floor, you're only going to be allowed to speak for two minutes because there's a lot of us and we want to get as much perspectives as we need to. So that is how we are going to be, you know, head going uh, ahead today. So I'm going to like to begin this conversation by, you know, um, encouraging everyone, um, starting with Adam, uh, who is in Benin. Uh, I'm going to encourage everyone that operates in more than one African country to talk to us about the challenges that you faced when you were trying to enter into new countries and uh, whether you did that successfully or you did that you know, unsuccessfully. Uh, the fact that you have presence in more than one African nation, what are some of the major challenges that you face in, in that expansion? So I will start with Adam and then I would like you all to just, if you'd like to address that, please just raise your hand. Uh, there's the raise hand function somewhere on your screen. Raise your hand. I'm going to acknowledge you. And then once Adam is done, you're going to go on next. So Adam, you have the floor. What are some of the challenges you face? And what countries? Tell us, start by telling us what countries you're operating and tell us the challenges. Okay. okay yes, so Adam, you have the floor. Quickly, um, we are based in Cote d'Ivoire. So quickly, we are based in Cote d'Ivoire. Tema in Ghana, Togo, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Belgium, France, and the Netherlands. So in Africa, I will, I will focus on Africa today. So in Africa, we first of all face the barrier of language, then the barrier of multiple currencies. So for instance, in West Africa, you could easily have to trade one boot, but using three different currencies, calling the Naira, the CFA, and the Ghana cities. So it was really difficult at the beginning because coming out from a French country and trying to settle in English countries was really, really, really difficult. And then all the, the, the issue we had, the documentations about crossing the borders, and we still have close borders between Benin and Nigeria, for instance knowing that most of our clients are from Nigeria. 
So it, we we still facing we still facing issues. So, but then the only way we try to come across that is by employing people from those countries. So for instance, my company in Nigeria only employs Nigeria. My company in South Africa only employs South Africa and so on. So that's the only solution I've found so far. Fantastic. That is such a very interesting perspective, Adam. Uh, and, and next, I would like to come to you, Natalie, because I, I see that you have uh, uh, expanded operations as well beyond Uganda. Uh, but just before I get on to Natalie, you know, Adam has referenced currency as a major challenge, language as a major challenge, and also uh, regulations. Uh, I, I would like to call that documentation regulation. So those are some challenges. And I really like the way that you have a you know, uh, navigated that problem by employing people in those organizations. So I would presume that what you have done is created, you know, versions of your entity in those other countries. So that is really good. Natalie, please, could you share with us uh, some of the challenges you face uh, in the countries that you're operating by starting, uh, start with the countries you're operating, the challenges you face, and how you are navigating those challenges? Uh, thanks, David. I agree with Adam. The first barrier we always face is language. So right now we just avoid Francophone countries because we don't have the in-house capacity. So I also think language goes beyond just the words. It's also about the culture and it's a lot harder to understand unless you have someone who's local, who's there. What we do with most countries is we employ local people. Like we're, um, we work in Kenya and Tanzania a lot. And there we have completely local staff and they just report back to head office in Uganda. But there's always a bit of a gap when you're trying to recreate something that works in one country to another just because of the cultural differences. One of our, my companies is a training program for African women and just trying to use examples that would work in stories and in classes that will work across different countries is challenging because something that's really common in one country is not in another. And so sometimes you have to explain and get someone to almost translate it into a local slang or to get some in a way that they understand it. So we also try to use local ambassadors, local influencers who understand what's going on in that country, get them to associate with the brand, get them to translate our message for our customers in that country. Um, we work, I, cause I work as chief of staff, I get to look into a lot of different sectors and a big challenge we also have is regulation and the legal side of things, setting up payment systems in different countries, different laws apply to different things. So you kind of have to have a team and advisors in every country. And it's really frustrating because you would think as Africa, we could find some sort of trade agreement where things can be simpler. Like with Uganda and Kenya, everything is quite easy now. But even something as simple as traveling across Africa is so challenging, especially now, I think, with the COVID pandemic seeing how much harder it is to get from across Africa than it is to get across the world. I got stuck in California for a few months because the airports were closed, but I have colleagues who are stuck in West Africa and they only just got back yesterday. It's taken four or five months for them to find a flight to get back home just because we have no existing networks and systems within ourselves. It's been so much easier to fly to Europe, the States or Asia than it is to fly across Africa. And I think small things like that are metaphors for how disconnected we are as countries. And it would be, I think, prudent of the business community to take initiative in connecting across borders, especially our generation where everything is digital and it's much easier. For example, I use Flutterwave in one of the companies because that way I can collect payments across Africa very simply. It all plugs into the mobile money, one bank account in Uganda, it's done. But before innovations like this, it's impossible. We've had companies across Africa for years and everything had to be completely separate and completely manual. So it's really good that we're using digitization and innovation to overcome these challenges now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. And you have highlighted certain uh, 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 things that are very, very cogent. I really love the fact, you know, that you highlighted the fact that it is even difficult to move, you know, and navigate within Africa uh, compared to what, what the experience is in trying to, you know, go to other places in the world. And, you know, another thing that you touched on that was very important is the cultural differences. And I, I'm sure that we're going to touch more on this, even as other people share, share their experiences. But just like you rightly said, one of the things that needs to be done is that we need to foster conversations such as the ones that we're having right now with platforms such as the African Quan. The entire business community as a whole needs to find new ways to bridge these gaps 
uh, that we currently have, you know, between countries across the continent. Nkosana, I see your hand. So Nkosana, please feel free to unmute your mic and go up next and share with us your perspectives. Yes, uh, one thing that maybe many of us were, 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 were under illusion is that Africa is a homogeneous continent. It's just one huge continent. If you strike it good home, you're going to strike it next way. You know, it's like listening to Alicia Keys saying, if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere in the world. It's not like that when you're doing business in Africa. Africa is a diverse, uh, fragmented market with the different regulatory frameworks that can either build or can break your business. Uh, one good uh, thing about Africa is that despite us being fragmented across the continent, more than 50 something countries, we still have the same problems. So when I talk about, about, about the same problems, I mean problems that we are solving as social innovators because we have fundamental problems such as inequality, fundamental problems such as uh, uh, environmental degradation. So when you get into a different country, be it you are doing business, that is solving any of the uh, lift, uh, 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 um, tension to challenges, you have found a niche. But now solving that niche is a process that requires you to be fully aware of the cultural and the historical background of that particular geographical location. Uh, for example, if you're going to uh, address environmental issues in SA, you, you have to know the regulations that uh, are managing that kind of sector. They may be different from us in, in Zimbabwe. And also there are certain sectors that are reserved for the locals. I was into manufacturing of swag. You know, if you go to Botswana, clearly they will tell you that backing uh, manufacturing is reserved for the locals. So if you're coming into, if you're coming into Botswana, introducing manufacturing, you're going to uh, face a lot of challenges because of the indigenization policies that are put in place. Then also, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is different from your own country. In my own country, it's easy to push through because of social capital base that how we have built over the years. But here we're moving into a different country altogether. You know no one. You only have a, a, a sharp business model. But a business model doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in an enabling environment that is actors. That is also other entrepreneurs who are your competitors. So it takes time to build that network and also a, a, a partnership. And in, in that process, remember, we're in business, we're not in charity. It means we're losing money. So one has to be mentally prepared to say maybe for the next coming six months, just three years, as I'm building up, these are the losses that I'm going to face. So mental aptitude is also critical. Very and critical. also, when you talk of mental aptitude, also you need to understand the sources of uh, financing oh. in different countries. Uh, in my own country, it might be easier, depending on my banking history, to access a loan. But accessing a loan in South Africa is extremely hard because I'm a foreigner. I have to apply for a work permit. I have to apply for a work visa. That might take me in six months. But in the process I'm making it. So those are other issues that people need to be fully aware of before venturing into different into other nations. Other the nations. Thank you so much, Nkosana, for those contributions. And so, uh, guys, I'm just going to remind you, if you'd like to jump in at any point, just raise your hand. I'm, I'm taking a look at everyone here. Just raise your hand so that I can acknowledge you and bring you into the conversation. And I'm just also going to say, uh, I'm going to touch on some, because from all the contributions we've taken so far, I can see some common threads already. So I'm going to ask those as a question. But I'm just going to give a few more people an opportunity to jump in onto this. And as you speak, um, Charles, I'm coming to you next because you've got operations as well, you know, in, in multiple countries. Um, as you speak, speak to us more in terms of the solutions. Uh, we could just very quickly highlight what the problems were, but in terms of the solutions that um, you have deployed that has enabled you to effectively function, uh, for instance, in your case, Charles, you function in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Kenya, in Rwanda. What were the solutions? Uh, because obviously, 
uh, there are cultural problems, regulatory problems, currency problems, you know, maybe in some instances, language problems. How are you able to overcome some of these things, Charles? Uh, uh, give us your perspective. Oh, yes. Um, I think even before you called me, I was just about to jump in and actually make a comment because, I mean, I've been listening to everybody and, I mean, it's just, this is really reassuring that some of these problems exist and we really need to find solutions, like you have said, because most of the problems that have been highlighted from every other person, payments, uh, moving things around, um, as, as small as West Africa is, you would realize that you can't even move the basic goods around without having a major huddle or without experiencing a major huddle. And I think one of the things that we have done as a business is we have tried as much as possible to digitize all of our services. So as opposed to just creating services and say, hey, we can help you do billboards, we can help you do this, we can help you do that. What we have done was to find a way to digitize all and all of our processes because some of the infrastructure around Africa with respect to move, moving things around Africa is not as smooth and as um, easy as possible like you would find in Europe or in America and other places. So what we tried to do was to digitize our business and find a way to ensure that we can definitely simplify our service so that the experience you get from, the experience you get with us in Nigeria is the same experience you would get with us in Ghana and it's also the same experience you would get in Kenya and in Rwanda. But in, in doing this, we have realized that yes, the internet is there, the infrastructure is there, you can digitize your business, but a whole lot of the businesses you would do across Africa still demands the face-to-face -face interaction. Yes. You still need to speak to people. You still need to, I mean, I like- There's a limit to how far digitization can go. Yes, there's a limit to how far digitization could go. And even when you digitize, you realize that you can only digitize or offer some of those services within the state capital. And most persons talk about Nigeria and they also talk about how, how fantastic the market is. But you would realize that they, all, they always talk about Lagos. Exactly. Right? But I mean, we have 200 million persons. These persons need other services. They also want to have the same user behavior. The business in the northern part of Nigeria also want communication services, also want to advertise their businesses. But it's very difficult for you to create that solution tailored around them because you would find out that the user experience when you create a product in Lagos with the internet penetration of almost 70%, that same product goes to the northern part of Nigeria with the internet penetration of maybe 40 or 30%, you'd realize that the user behavior is very, very different. And one of the ways that we have been able to do this is digitize our business and just as much as possible to um, support the ecosystem and try to ensure that we can partner with the government in some cases, create solutions in some cases that will help solve some of these infrastructural issues, not necessarily mm -hmm. the, the infrastructural so, issues. So what I hear you say there, Charles, is that you're also beginning to think uh, beyond just your own business, but you're beginning to think about ecosystem solutions that would that would you know create yes. platforms for other people, which is very fantastic. Now, yes. um, Zamir, I'm going to come to you very quickly, but before I go to you, um, Charles had mentioned that uh, Charles had mentioned the fact that digitization can cover everything. Now, Adil, uh, Adil Osman, I, I hope Adil, you're still here with us. Just before I get to Zamir. Uh, Hadil, you have a practical business. You are in creative, right? Creative fashion, all of this. So there is a limit to how far digitization can go in your kind of industry. Uh, and you provide services to clients across multiple you know, countries in Africa. Uh, how have you been able to navigate this? So uh, previously, we would be able to travel. So for instance, last year, we had some work to do so uh, in Kenya. So we went there in person. But now because of COVID and because of digitization, one of the services or the two main services that we've been providing um, uh, online have been consultancy, obviously, um, and also concept development, which is done through, you know, we'll, we'll create like a map of, for example, if they have a project, we'll create the map for that and then send it. So it's all via emails and, you know, uh, video calls. And then the majority of our work has been graphic design, even, even within Sudan itself, because we're not able to go on sets and you know, uh, work in production since everything is closed up. So 
for the past four months, I want to say the majority of our work has been consultancy um, and uh, concept development and graphic design. So we had to kind of push back everything else until uh, we're able to either travel again or basically go out and start working. Fantastic. And, and those are perspectives uh, that come into play, especially as we think about the impact that COVID has had to, you know, escalate those problems that already already exist. Zamir, from, from your experience, I mean, you also uh, are in architecture, which is a very, very practical industry. Uh, what has been your experience in terms of, you know, um, trying to trying to expand? Have you ever attempted to expand into other areas, uh, even regionally, maybe not even across the continent? But have you, have you tried that? And what has your experience been? Look, I have tried and I'm successful in it. I'm very grateful for that. There are some basics that we must think about before we even go into certain things. They may sound obvious, but it's what makes you correct. So it's, what, what are you selling? What are you selling? Do you know the right people in that gut? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud. Hello? I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of background. Okay. So, and then again, identify the right people in the country you're going into. Identify yourself with the trade aspects, the exhib exhibitors in that country that uh, are aware of the product. For example, if you want to be in construction, you have to be able to associate yourself with the right people in that country. And then, then of course, you have to set up meetings with suppliers, contacts, because you can't, you can't build, you can't build trust in one meeting. You'll have to meet them several times before they even trust you. Before you can actually shake hands and say let's work together that, that is so true that is so true and i really like the fact that you touched on the basics and if i if i you know synthesize what you've said with one of the things that adam said earlier and, and a few other contributors said earlier about having to you know establish new teams within those different countries i think that that you know really really comes to the fore um sean uh, what has your experience been, uh, especially now with regards to um, the the um, w w one of the things I was talked about earlier was the cultural challenges and like uh, Unkosana said earlier, Africa mm. many times is treated as an homogeneous place, and mm. this is what I want to ask: Should we begin to think in terms of cities? rather than mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking in terms of countries because like Charles said mm -hmm. in nigeria if you're talking about nigeria and you're talking about you know the nigerian market lagos mm -hmm. is a completely different market than abuja abuja is a completely yes. different market to port harcourt right and i'm sure that is the same with many other areas and many other countries in in, in africa so sean mm -hmm. uh tell us what your own experience has been in terms of this should we be treating Africa as a whole? Should we be treating Africa in terms of countries or should we really be thinking in terms of cities? Well, I think Africa is very diverse. To think of it as a whole, as one piece would be very mistaken. So I would say, because look, Africa is very, very, it's a very, very complicated puzzle. It's a continent with 52, with 52 countries. 54. Right? And 54, right? And 50, of those 54 countries, only about 30 of them signed the Intra-Africa Trade Agreement, you know, which is supposed to increase uh, Intra-Africa Trade in Africa by 52%. But when you talk about free trade and uh, the regulations around Africa, you're talking about uh, each country individually. So depending on your target market, I would target uh, each place uh, either as a city or as uh, whichever way you want to go about it. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that contribution, yeah. Sean. And I really do okay. agree with you that treating Africa as one, just yeah. one whole, is, is never yeah. a good strategy. Uh, Ratiba, yeah. I see your hand. What, what are your thoughts on the subject matter? Yes, I think um, I agree with most of, most of the, the leaders here because um, the first thing, like you were saying, is um, the relationships that we don't have with different countries, right? So, um first thing i think this is one of the solutions that you know you came up with we had different people from different places fostering that relationship so that you have a specific person you know in that area 
Because it doesn't know in, the, in that specific country that you can communicate with, you know, and they give you the insights of the place that you you want to go into if it's, it is part of your market. So I think I agree um, with the last speaker that says that you must target each country differently if it is your target market so you know what's going on in that place. And also identifying the right people, like Charles has said, um, identify the right people in that space so that they give you insights um, of what is really going on in that space, what's the market, what are the rules, what are the precautions that you have to do, what are the you know, institutions that you have to go to to apply for things, so that when you get into that place and you introduce um, whatever products that you have, you're already aware of you know, the different you know, things that you need to, to get to. Yeah. F fantastic uh thank you very much for that contribution latiba and guys remember if you want to jump in at any point just raise your hand you know uh, uh using the the buttons on your screen zamir i saw your hand you have a thought you want to share what was actually the gentleman before was really spot on sharing the same views that i had Oh, great, great, fantastic. Um, Kosana, I see your hand. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear can you. you. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Samir. Please go ahead. Sorry, I think that's what I'm saying. I agree with the gentleman before because without understanding your market, you can the basics, right? You can't, anything, you can't get anything done. Fantastic, fantastic. I, I totally agree with you. Kosana, what are your thoughts? You want to share, share some thoughts? And I do believe, I do believe, I do believe oh, yeah. from the... Oh, okay. okay. Zamir, I think the network from your end is, is quite hazy. Um, so, so let's, let's get Nkosana's perspective and then I can come back to you. Hopefully the network will be better. Nkosana, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, I think some of the issues have also been highlighted. Uh, sure. I think uh, our generation uh, is different. Uh, our generation is different from the previous one because we we have an enabling environment uh, through IT and digital markets. While it is good, but also we need to bear in mind that, like what uh, the other uh, guy said, that Africa is still living in physical interaction more than virtual um, markets. Why? It's because much of our interaction requires have to convince the next person to buy into our idea. Then how do we move uh, into new uh, virtual markets? One thing I'm grateful for is belonging to Mandela Washington Fellowship. You know, it took America to unite Africans in, in Washington. <laughs> I found it very strange. Eh? We all travel to the US to meet each other. <laughs> So uh, because of that, it was able for me. It, it was easy for me then to to pinpoint and say, if I'm going to do business, supposedly in South Africa, my go-to person would be Andy Lenshansa. He already understands the South African environment. He's a local. If I'm able to move to do business in in in, in Botswana, there's Hamid and I'm able to relate to so that kind of social networking. It's very, very important. And also, I'm happy that Forbes Africa has done the same for us. Forbes Africa said and understand, which is a good initiative. If it wasn't for that, maybe we wouldn't even know each other ever. But because of Forbes Africa said and the we were able to, you know, look into the group chat and say who's doing what in this particular country and shout out. You know, there is no harm in shouting out to say, I want to expand business in Uganda. Who's in Uganda? Who can assist me with the red tape? So, so that network and having people on ground is something ground. that's very critical to the connection. Thank you very much, Gosana. I Thank see you. that. Maliha, um, you have some thought. Now, I see your hand, uh, Sean. I see your hand, Adil. Um, I, I'm going to get to you guys, but let me take Maliha's contributions very quickly. And before I take Maliha's contributions, this is a conversation, guys. So to everyone who hasn't spoken, my Ngoni, MB, uh, Mibi, Ray, 
Ray Itumeleng, uh, sorry if I'm muttering your name, uh, Pinky, Jaja, Bright. I want to see your hand so that we can get to you. Don't just listen, participate. All right. So, uh, um, Maliha, what are your thoughts? Maliha, you're muted. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. So, unmute first. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry it's about okay. that. Well, that's half of my minute gone now. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to what has been said earlier by a lot of the participants, um, there's a lot of common factors that are coming up, which is really good. So I understand that a lot of pe people are feeling the same things that I'm feeling. Um, on things that have not been mentioned, and you know, um, in our beautiful region of Africa, there are a lot of countries that have a lot of political instability. When you have political instability, that is a big drawback in any in any factor in in terms of you know a political instability will lead in a deterioration of the kind of infrastructure that you have so when a lot of people talk about this digitization um, this gets very much affected the other thing that i have to do is in my sector where it is primarily education it's a very practical and hands-on face-to-face interaction that you need especially in the in the specialized learning that i do um, Having content that is, you know, developed for specific users is very difficult. You have to have the technical know-how. And the other thing that also comes with it is the expense that is involved in catering to be able to facilitate that transition all over. Fantastic. Uh, those are really, really good points. And I really enjoy the fact that you drew attention to one part of this whole conversation that we had not touched on, which is political instability. Uh, hopefully we get enough time to come and address those topics specifically because there are quite a number of topics that are popping up, right? I'm noting them down. Hopefully we can really uh, get some more time to, to have conversations about that. But Sean, I'm going to come to you, but uh, I'm going to uh, give the floor to Pinky now. So Pinky, uh, you, you could go ahead with your contribution, then I'm going to come to Sean. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to um, say that I agree with most leaders and um, add another point in saying that we also need to um, look into improving the skills of our African population, that we need to also now look into um, being able to take production from the transformation of raw materials right up to the final product and not actually have to import and export in the international um, countries, but to have that happening transnationally. So for instance, for us who are mining gold, to be able to send it to um, other countries in Africa, to be able to manufacture. And um, that way we can actually grow um, each other's economy because we are importing and exporting from each other for the betterment for each, um, uh, each country. And looking into my um, sector, which is health, even with the beds, like right now we're facing a pandemic, um, with the doctors um, that we needed, we can actually um, you, um, utilize the, the resources that we have as um, African countries. So I really, really think that for barriers to be broken, we need to actually equip ourselves and the youth to actually know the different skills that they can learn um, and that we, so that we are known for them as Africans. Fantastic, thank you, thank you very much, Pinky. Uh, Terence, I see your hand, but just before I come to you, Sean, you have the floor. And guys, remember, as you, if you're about to make a contribution, ensure that you turn on your video so that we can see you and unmute your mic. So Sean, you have the floor. All right, let me turn my video on. Okay, so to add to what we were discussing uh, previously, I strongly feel like um, intra-Africa trade is currently only at 80%, not just because of infrastructure and barriers, but also because of the fact that some of us may be stuck in a situation where we're making products as entrepreneurs that cover just enough or that do just enough. It's very important before you can talk about a product being bought somewhere else across Africa to make a superior product. You have to work on whatever you're making and say, look, this is what I'm making and it's going to cost this much and I can import it to A, B, C, D. And there are always channels to get you things uh, in a, and around Africa. Africa is very complicated. Look at, if you want to hear how, Af how complicated Africa is, ask a truck driver that drives to DRC <laughs> from South Africa. But get, those roads are they're, they're in shambles. The roads are very bad. But guess what? Every single day, 
thousands of trucks travel down those roads. You know why? Because they're bringing in a superior product from elsewhere that they can't find in their own country. So if you make a superior product and say, look, it's going to cost me an additional 50 US dollars to get you this amazing product to your country. And I can't find it locally within my country. I'll buy it. Sure, you know, I'll sure. buy it. And that's another thing about Africans. We like things. <laughs> if you make something that's worth the money, we'll, we're willing to spend it, you know, or save up until we can afford it. Fantastic. Thank you so yeah. much, Sean. So now I'm going to take Terence, and right after Terence, I'm going to take Ray. Ray, I'm glad to see your hand because I know you haven't spoken all day. So Terence, what are your thoughts? Uh, okay. I want to speak a lot about um, how as an entrepreneur, it becomes important to localize your product. Uh, to the to a particular market to the market where you want to move into uh, because when um, uh, looking at like what what uh, Sean was talking about like if you've got a superior product you can still move it into another country but at the same time you might have a superior product but there are certain laws in that uh, country you're moving into as to uh, at times there could be percentages of locally procured uh, ingredients or, 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 st or staff or employees uh, that have to be considered in whatever you're doing. Um, and that's uh, something that you know, we realized when we were moving into Zambia. So we were fixated with our unique offering and we got there and uh, the government <laughs> said, no, actually you have to consider so many locals and so much local procurement that then had to change the complete costing and operation of uh, our Zambian entity, uh, which then set, set us back a couple of months uh, in terms of operation. So, you know, it, it becomes one of those uh, issues whereby, you know, uh, it might be the country next door <clears throat> but when you move around in Africa, there's so much uh, to take in mind such that uh, it isn't, I mean, it then becomes not so easy to grow. But mm -hmm. then you then realize the importance of the skills you then get when you then deal with the locals because they give you that knowledge uh, and they can then relate even easy, easily for you such that going forward, it then becomes easy. So I just wanted to say that, you know, as you grow across Africa, never uh, look over, you know, that local company the need to, to that localize. either is required by law or that you can generally benefit by involving in your organization as you grow. Well, thank you very much for that contribution, Terence. I think that one of the things that that does is it captures the essence of some of the things we talked about earlier. Africa is not an homogeneous place, right? We have a lot of differences in many regards, even though we still have a lot of similarities. As a result, we cannot just copy and paste from one country to the other. We need to localize the context of the products that we have created uh, or that we are creating. So uh, I see Pinky's hand, but before I, I take Pinky, uh, Ray, I saw your hand much earlier. Uh, so Ray, please uh, go ahead, you have the floor. Turn on your video, turn on your mic, and then share with us your thoughts. Um, hi, everybody. Um, unfortunately, I can't turn on my video at this time, but uh, the chats are very interesting. Um, I'm not an entrepreneur, but I want to ask the people around the table, uh, in terms of overcoming the perception gap of um, inferior goods if you will um i mean point sean raised a very interesting point about the superiority of the products that we must offer and so i think the the contrast side of that is that it means there's an underlying assumption that perhaps sometimes um things that we get in africa sometimes are maybe of of not a superior quality so how have entrepreneurs that have ventured into other countries how they kind of overcome that and um, just final point being that there's been a lot of talk about the physical interaction and um, how it's such a critical part of doing business and um, I feel that um, even when moving into digital businesses tech and um, 
different types of businesses, those perceptions that used to confine people's minds in terms of um, the barrier of physical interaction, those things don't exist when you when technology exists. So how have people kind of overcome those kind of things in terms of um, between countries? I hope my yes. is clear. Oh. Definitely, Ray. Uh, and thank you for that question and that contribution. It is very germane and it is very, very important. So, because there, the, like you rightly said, there is a there's a perception uh, that the, the quality of products and services that are created on the continent, it, even Africans hold this per perception. We would rather buy something from from Italy or from Turkey or from Dubai, you know, that you'd buy something from Sudan or from Uganda or from Gabon. All right. So, so this is a major thing now. I would want us to address that topic next, but I just want us to round up on this issue of, you know, localizing. Maliha has something she wants to say. Pinky has something she wants to say. So I'm going to take Pinky, and right after that, I'll take Maliha, and then we'll move to the question of dealing with the mindset. Okay, so Adam wants to talk about that as well. Uh, before we move to the question around dealing with the mindset on the continent, uh, I'm going to take Pinky first. Then I will take Maliha, then I'll take Adam. Pinky, you have the floor. Okay, and two cases as well. Okay, thank you, Lida. Um, I would like to say that our leaders, as in government, need to come together as different um, um, entities and just come together and represent us as the African continent. Um, because industries cannot survive on their own we need to merge or marry both the government and the, and the industries so that we can be able to break all of these barriers. Um, we need to also look into opening the trading um, amongst us as um, African continents. Um, and the best way to do that is by having our government um, having these kind of conversations. Um, the best way is for them to be even involved in these kind of conversations, sure. um, for these kind of conversations not to be limited on, only to us um, as leaders and for us to actually take them back um, and take it to the community because that's the importance um, of this whole thing that we, the whole conversation is that we have to change our mindset and actually bring it back home and know that for everything to work, we have to first fix home. Um, and so by changing or renewing our mindset and thinking that we can actually get the resources here, we can actually import and export right here and um, produce locally, employ locally, pay on time, and um, to, to, to actually run things professionally here and not think that it only takes doing business internationally to think that you've made it or that you have the right assistance to be able Fantastic. to know that we can actually have everything right here. Thank you so much for that, Pinky. And just let me let me make this uh, 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 conv let me state this to everyone. Um, one of the objectives, longer term objectives that we have with the African Corps is to escalate uh, the thoughts and the and the ideas that are shared on this platform uh, onto higher levels. So and also to bring people from multiple you know ecosystems government, social enterprise, business, uh, and other other uh, ecosystems into this conversation so that we can have more robust conversations. So so we're still uh, uh, rounding up on this on this conversation around around localizing content. So um, who's next? I think I said Maliha is next. And after Maliha, we'll take Adam, we'll take Adil, we'll take uh, Gift. Maliha. You're muted, Maliha. You're muted. You have to unmute. Hello, Maliha. You have to unmute your mic first. That's it. Yeah. Uh, Maliha, I still cannot hear you. I still cannot hear you. Okay, so what, what will, what hopefully uh, uh, Malia can, can get sorted. Uh, Adam, can you, can you go ahead with your perspectives? Hello, can you guys still hear me, Adam?
you're on mute. I think you're still on mute. I'm not on mute. Hadiu, please go ahead. Am I? Oh, you're fine. I can hear Maliha. She can go oh, ahead. Oh, hi. Okay, Maliha. Okay, okay, so think it's Maliha, go maybe ahead. Maybe the internet connection. Fine. Uh, going back to the, the topic that we just had. Uh, Davis, it's, it's a relief to hear that, you know, the views that are shared on this forum um, are going to be taken one step at a time and get into the ears of our leaders that we elect, hoping for a change. The one thing that I feel is it, the, the bureaucracy and uh, red tape in the way of us being able to um, have I, I talk primarily on the education sector. Every region has its own system. They're doing both international, they're doing both local. I think Benjamin, who is in the same field as I am, may, may share the same thoughts or understand the challenge in education of a different country. The one thing that we do really um, face a problem with is the conversion of whatever system it is that we have done to be able to um, integrate into the system or the uh, the our leaders came together and there was maybe Um, I, I think the internet quality from your end, um, Maliha, is, is freezing up because you're, you're going and coming, going and coming. Uh, so Hadil, able to infiltrate the market. Oh, oh, okay, great, great, great. Hadil, please go ahead. Um, I just wanted to add something. I feel like everyone basically runs. Um, the fact that I'm from Sudan, like compared to the other the other people, yeah, everyone here is from different countries, obviously. But Sudan, in comparison to truly at the like the very uh, like uh, importing, exporting, or even as young creatives, even in the creative field, which is considered you know the easiest. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, so it's it's interesting to see that. Of course, we I agree with Pinky 100%. We definitely need government involvement, and our political situation is very different as well because we're trying from a dictatorship to hopefully a democratic state. So, um, we're still trying to figure out where we can fit and how we can reach like that. Our work is actually smart. So we can change mindset so we can actually bring you know, um, have economy thriving because we have hyper um, there's a lot uh, before Yeah, um, I think Davis is having a network problem. Oh, oh yeah, uh, I, I think there was some network problem from my end. So sorry about that. Um, please, please, uh, Adil was sharing a thought. Uh, are you done, Adil? Uh, okay. Uh, can, can you guys still hear me? Can everyone still hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, guys, uh, very quickly, uh, we're, we're halfway through. I want us to talk about uh, mindset in, in two perspectives. So when you think about the African continent, someone raised much earlier uh, the fact that, I think it was Ray who raised uh, the fact that there is a perception uh, on the continent uh, about the quality level of products created on the continent. And, you know, 
the first thing is how do we begin as entrepreneurs and social innovators how do we begin to um break down these perceptions or these preconceptions how do we overcome them so that we can have greater distribution on the continent that is on the one hand on the other hand there is also uh, something that has come to the fore in the conversation we talked about the fact that uh we need to localize because a lot of um countries have you know different laws and regulation around what it is that they want now Africa as a continent has countries that develop at very different paces. Nigeria is the largest economy. South Africa is, is, a, is a, in quote, for lack of a better description, uh, a third world country with first world infrastructure. Uh, Rwanda is leading with uh, technology. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is we all develop at different paces. How do we ensure that the successes of one country uh, is opened up or, or helps other countries to be succeed as well. I mean, I would love to see an Africa where, you know, is collectively grown in terms of technology adoption, industrialization, uh, development education. How can we ensure that African development is more, you know, balanced, so to say? So in terms of the mindset, there are two, two dimensions to that question. Uh, we would like to go first on this one. Ratiba, I think I saw your hand. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'll take Pratiba and then I'll come to Charles. Pratiba, go ahead. Um, yeah. Yes, um, can I also yeah, take on this? I, I think the issue of mindset, like I was thinking... Thinking about it when we're talking of each other as, you know, different countries. And, and also that um, comes in all the uh, conception of so when you have to do anything, so you're already, you know, doubtful on that. I think we need to, maybe it is psychological you know and secondly i see it with with let's say local products i see it with local products that i think david mentioned the fact that we would rather buy a louis vuitton you know other than just buying you know a, a different in you know, the local product. we already have more trust to put into you know those those um the army product that any local product wants to be promoted and also be a premium product becomes um there's um a new product that came in it's clothing called Makosa. it's a traditional premium you know traditional premium um brand that is that is really growing and doing very well but you you hear people start saying what yo it's too expensive yo is this but they can, but to go buy Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton. You know, see, yeah. So there's a there's a men, mental shift that needs to happen there, um, to literally be able to trust even a local product because it, before it can even go international. Because our problem is as Africans, we will start embracing our own products when they they are embraced internationally or in Europe or wherever. Right. So we need to start. So we need to take and, the lead essentially uh, in yeah, embracing our so, own products yeah awesome awesome uh charles please go ahead anyways thank you great 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 conversation from 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 everybody um i see my man bright right jaja big up um so before before we get to so before i basically talk about what we can do and how we can transfer this development from one part of africa to another part of africa there was something very instrumental that, or very insightful that Pinky said. I mean, she talked about skills, right? And so the reason I, 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 I had a shout out to Jaja because he's the, he's the biggest skills promotion person in Nigeria. And he's big on developing skills across Nigeria or, or and across the African continent. And I think whenever we talk about development, we always do not want to focus on this. And we need to really understand that it's, it's not just about having the right environment and the right everything. We must develop 
ourselves. Um, I did, I trained at the Alibaba Business School on digital economy and digitizing businesses. And you will typically hear a, anybody from Asia or a typical Chinese entrepreneur say, Nigeria is at, at best maybe 10 years behind China. The fact about it is the environment is the same. The people are the same. The difference between China and Nigeria technically is the skills, right? And we need to really develop this and we need to really develop this across Africa. And we need to understand that. So moving towards um, how do we transfer the development from one part of Africa to another part of Africa, we need to develop Africa as Africans. But while we are developing, we need to understand that we need to develop right. We need to create our brand right. We need to train ourselves right. We can't just say we want to build products that would, that would go beyond the Louis Vuitton and we, and we do it from a shabby perspective or we do not put in the right structure within our business or we do not put in the right branding within our business. Your HR structure must be right, no matter how small. Whether you're a 10-man company or a five-man company, you need to put all of these policies right. HR, and accounting, legal, all of the things. Right product. One of the decisions we made when we started our business was we were not going to use pirated softwares in our computers or pirated Microsoft softwares in, in, in our computers within our business. Yes, it's expensive to I like that. Yes, it's expensive to be able to make that decision. However, <clears throat> You need to do things right, right? You need to understand that you're building a business that is not just in Nigeria, but that is not just in Lagos. You need to build a product that can be moved from one point in Africa to another point in Africa. Because if you don't build a product that, that can move to Kenya or to South Africa or to Zimbabwe, the products from Europe and the products from China would always we'll go, go there to before Australia. you. And, and opportunity meets the right product. Opportunity or resources goes to the right product. It doesn't matter if you're white or black or from Nigeria or you're from Kenya. If you have the right product, the opportunity would flow towards that. And the second thing I want to quickly point very, out, very quickly, very quickly, very quickly. My time is almost fast spent, is the fact that, so the question was, how do we involve the government? Yes, we can involve the government by having conversations or being at the level of where we need to have conversations. However, we also need to, create products and partner with the government. Let's not meet the government and say we need money. Let's not meet the government and say we need this. We need to create those products and tell the government, one of the products we just built in, in, in Nigeria and we're using through that product, we're training about 10,000 persons on digital economy. It's called beyondperception.io. Is we built a product that could train people on digital economy. And we only went to meet the government and say, hey, you have a database of these youths please send these persons to our platform for them to get trained for free as a pilot stage. So we are not going to meet it to say, give us the money. That's going to take a very huge bureaucracy. Mm. That's going to take a whole lot. One of the mm. biggest skills platform in Nigeria is done by Bright Jaja. It's not done by the Nigerian government. Fantastic. It's not done by any other person. Fantastic. It's done by a single individual. So we must understand that is how we go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you so much, Charles. I really loved the things that you touched on, especially this thing. What you just mentioned last, you know, is something I'd never thought of before. To meet government with new perspectives, not just, you know, give us money or that is really good. Now, uh, I see Bright's hand. Uh, so I'm going to take Bright. Then right after Bright, I'm going to take Gift. Gift's hand has been up for a long time. So Bright, I'm going to take your contribution. Then I'm going to take Gift. And then I'll take uh, Hadil and Sean. Bright, go ahead. Bright, you're muted. Thank you have to unmute. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much for this. I think um, this is an awesome platform. Any platform that brings young Africans together, especially people who are driven, passionate to solve a problem is just amazing. Because I think, and the reason why I'm saying that is this, just speaking on the topic, um, thank you Charles for the shout out. Charles is, I mean, we have a meeting that we're yet to have. We're supposed to have this meeting yesterday, but it didn't happen, but we, we have a major collaboration coming up soon and I can't wait for that. Um, the reason why I said that is this, right? When you think of Africa, what comes to mind? Internally and externally. What do you think Africa thinks about each other? That's one, that's internally. What do you think about 
how Africans are perceived outside Africa. That mindset, first of all, internally affects how we interact with, with each other. Mm. And that mindset externally affects how the world interacts with us. What is the image of Africa in the world? I mean, when you're talking from the global perspective, LeBron James says something, he's my favorite guy. He said, no matter how much money you have, no matter how famous you are, you're just another nigger. You can scratch that during the edit, but like, that's what he said. Same thing, Jay-Z said something, rich nigger, poor nigger, still nigger. Doesn't matter who you are, you're still seen. As long as you're black, you're still seen as. Why is that? What is, why is that the perspective? Why is that when you see someone from China, you have a perspective of production? When you see someone from, from India, you think of technology. When you see someone from, from Dubai, you think of wealth, oil. When you think, see someone from Africa, you just think of poverty. You think of a lot of things. And I, look, I, look at, I look at Black Lives Matter. I've never actually spoke about that, that topic. But I look at Black Lives Matter and I said, am I, it's one line, I just looked at one line. Everybody that hates it can, I don't know, they, don't, they can't find me anyways. Black lives will never matter or except we have economical power. Ah. The reason why China is, you can't talk down on Chinese people. They have economical power. They will tell Trump to shut up. Russia will do the same thing. But can Africa say anything? No, because Africa is not even united in the first place. Our president cannot say nothing. Do we have a collaborated African network? African Union? BS. Because what have they done? Africa, um, um, European Union just passed out almost 80, 80, 50, 50, 58 billion euros to support the entire country, the, the member country. What has African Union done during this pandemic? Mm. So the problem is not, bro, the problem is, is deep. It's deep. It's deep. It's deep. <laughs> Serious. Like, the problem is deep. It's beyond. It's, it's so, it's deep mentally. As in, internally, we don't even trust each other. We don't even trust each other, bro. <laughs> and that's the truth. We thank, don't. Thank you for, so much for that, Brian. And I think that what you've brought to the fore is something that is incredibly important. Even from a mindset standpoint, within us and even externally, like you said, internally, externally, it's a huge challenge. And, you know, it's really important that we have these conversations because, again, these critical truths come up. And then what it does is it provides us with platforms to begin to explore solutions. Gift, uh, please, you have the floor. Uh, and right after Gift, uh, I, take, I take a deal and then I take Sean. Yeah, I just want to agree with Bride, uh, Charles as well, as well as Pinky. Uh, I think it's much of the mindset change uh, where I think there's need much of a civic education to the nation, you know? Because I think someone said like it took America to put Africans together in Washington. You know, like if we start having like exchange programs between African countries, I think that would be awesome. But we rely on maybe America to come in to intervene for us to meet, which I, I feel like it's, it's not on. What is African Union doing? What is uh, SADC doing? What is Comesa doing? Uh, you, you find out that um, it's doing less, you know, uh, of what they can be doing. Uh, one thing uh, I think uh, I can say is uh, I feel like uh, we need young people as well in those uh, organizations, in those, in those um, I like to try to make decisions, you know. But I see like much of the people who are there, there are people maybe who have been, they just want to maybe eat money or maybe not much focusing on their, on our businesses, the small businesses, you know, because uh, as myself, when I was studying a business uh, from Malawi, uh, I was trying to uh, do it in, in SA as well. There were a lot of things which um, uh, they were hindering, you know, like in terms of paperwork and the like. It's easy for big companies maybe to move around because they have money and stuff. But for a small company, it's always hard because policies which can support small business to expand, they're not there. And African Union, it was supposed to have maybe a platform where if you need some, uh, like maybe a data or maybe, okay, how can you get to SA? You see that information is not there. If I want to maybe to expand to Zambia, you find out to find that information maybe on the platform, it's hard. That's why maybe it comes in where you have to have maybe people who do you know in SA, then you start linking up, which is okay. But how do you know someone if there's no platform where you could, they're putting 
uh, young people together. Thanks to Forbes, maybe thanks to y y uh, uh, Yali as well, which they are doing. But what is African Union doing? What is, what is African from... Union doing? Thank hey, you very much, Gift, for bringing is, that up. Yeah. Thank you very much for bringing that up. And guys, I, I'm just going to remind you, right? Uh, please, as much as you can, we have a lot of people who want to contribute. Please keep your keep keep your contributions very very uh, you know time conscious. So I see your hand, Natalie. I see your hand. Praise. I'll come to you all. Uh, but Adil, you have the floor right now, and then I'll come to Sean right after Adil. Uh, thank you so much. So um, in terms of mindset, um, I definitely agree with everything that has been said so far about how we as Africans, we really value what is, you know, imported from elsewhere or the big names. And I really like the fact that, you know, you mentioned um, um, one of my favorite brands, which is Matos. So I hope I'm not I'm saying it properly. But yeah, um, one of the main things that I do um, as, a, as an activist within the sustainability and fashion space is that we are working on two projects as of right now. So we were able to contact an international organization called Fashion Revolution. And so we're launching the local chapter um, on the 1st of August. And the idea is to really um, allow people, allow the citizens who are also consumers to value what is locally produced, to value what is done properly in terms of econom economically, socially, and environmentally. Um, and we are going to collaborate with a lot of cultural centers, a lot of um, major figures here to really hone in on that and make it like a part of our culture, you know, appreciating our, um, our craft craftsmanship, appreciating what we have and purchasing that um, instead of, you know, constantly seeking uh, what is out there because we have, we have that in us. We have the materials, we have the ability. Uh, yes, we might not have governmental support. Yes, the economy is really bad. Our situations are not helpful, but if we're able to just create from what we've got and to market it within our communities and then to, you know, market it elsewhere outside of Africa and, and you know, to the world, then we can get that white man's money back. Um, we, you know, we, we're basically, you know, slapping colonization in its face at this point and we create our industries until we reach the level where we can, um, as activists and as people that work in the field, we can actually create these policies. So it's a long, it's a long road, but it's getting there. Another thing as well, we're about to launch a social enterprise where we want to create clothing from upcycled materials, uh, which are obviously, um, um, you know, material and trade. We have a lot of issues with pollution because of, you know, the excess that we get flown in from the West and whatnot. And at the same time, working with marginalized women in Darfur, where, you know, they don't have abilities to make money, they're struggling. So when you empower your people and you give them the ability to be financially independent, but also to create that cycle of, in, you know, of industrialism in the country, then you are capable of growing. Um, so yeah, we have a five-year plan and hopefully before that we are able to, to really cause proper social change within the community. And uh, we, we hope that we can collaborate with other people in, in, in neighboring countries to really make this not just a local movement, but a regional African movement. Thank well. you very much for that, Adil. And guys, just before I take Sean's contribution, uh, once I'm done with Sean, I'll come to Natalie and then I'll take praise. But before I take those contributions, I just also want to mention that uh, one of the objectives with this platform is that we can learn from each other's successes so uh, and, and that we can also create opportunities for us to collaborate with each other so that the things that are working for one person, we can learn from that and then we can, if possible, adapt them to the so solutions that we are advancing so that we can have, you know, shared growth, shared prosperity that not only would improve, you know, the things that we do, but also grow impact across the continent. So, Sean, you have the floor. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So just to add to, like, I completely agree with everything that's been said so far. And just to add to some of the previous statements, I think we will never be in a position or reach a point where, as young people, we are fully aligned with government and regulations, you know, let alone every government in Africa. So it's also up to us as entrepreneurs, as young people, to come, to come up with solutions that kind of circumvent the regulations that are currently out there. If you look at someone like Fred Swanica, for example, he started uh, Africa Leadership University. There were so many regulations that were in place that actually slowed their process down, but they didn't stop it. They started something called ALX, which is kind of like uh, a leadership campus in different countries where they couldn't get the proper regulatory body, bodies to approve their requests in time. And I can also tell you, give you another example. Uh, in Zimbabwe right now, Zimbabwe is right next to South Africa, but it's easier 
to buy something from Amazon in the United States and ship it to Zimbabwe than it is to buy the same thing right next door, South Africa, to bring it into Zimbabwe. And why is that? It's because the entrepreneurs from America made it possible, they made it simple to, do, to, to go through that process. Right. So, it's, so you can't say it's an issue of things like regulations in, in, in that regard. And I completely agree that regulations are a huge, huge factor. But for us to start moving quickly, if we place our energy towards working together to create solutions that kind of connect Africa digitally, because the internet breaks so many borders, it makes a lot of things possible that weren't possible before. You know, in uh, another uh, example, referencing back to the example that I gave you of uh, DRC having a very bad road in terms of transporting and logistics to the country, but people, thousands of trucks every single day would stand whatever it has to give, uh, whatever it has to give, and they make it through to make sure that they deliver whatever the consignments they're delivering, right? Because there's a huge demand for those products in, 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 in that space. So no matter what, we can't say that it's impossible. It'll be difficult, but it's not impossible. Definitely, through. definitely. I strongly yeah. believe that as well, Sean. And I like the fact mm. that, you know, it, your responses and your perspective that you shared uh, really throws mm. light on a solution-focused approach. While these challenges yeah. are there, regulation and, and the rest of them, you know, uh, there are yeah. organizations and businesses outside of Africa that have penetrated yeah. deeply into several countries in Africa. Oh, yeah. And if we look yeah. at the things that they've done, we can learn uh, a lot from them. And then we can also foster conversations and collaborations to ensure that mm. our solutions that we that we develop in our different countries are exportable to other countries and also that we can also interact uh, from a commercial standpoint between countries. So Natalie, you have the floor. Uh, Natalie, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, I really love this topic, especially what Bright said, because I think as Africa, when we think of the whole continent and we look at the demographics, the young people are finally outnumbering the old. Yet, unfortunately, in most of our governments, it's still much older people in charge. So it's almost a waste of time and energy to be complaining about the government, asking the government to change systems, regulations. It's so hard to teach an old dog new tricks. What I have found has been really effective. I spent a lot of time in the last two years understanding the art of communications, mm. spreading the message, doing the PR, trying to inspire young Africans to take initiative so that the charity begins at home. We have to start coming up with our own solutions to our own challenges. We can't wait for the politics. We can't wait for the presidents to agree to change. We can't wait for the white people to keep sending us aid and making decisions for us. And this system has existed since the colonialists left us and we have failed to change it. Even with all the startups, with all the innovation, with all the Africans who study abroad and come back they're even, they're such a small proportion that come back compared to the ones that stay. But still, as much as like we in this platform have managed to have success, we have got to find a way to get more people to this level. We have got to inspire our peers and those behind us to do more. We cannot wait anymore for to be saved by the white man or to be saved by our aging presidents and our aging government. And so I found that it's been really effective to share our stories and to inspire and to mentor and to guide other young people because our struggle as Africans is huge. Yes. We need every last person we can to be working on these problems with us. So the more people we can get in the movement to try and solve Africa's problems, to innovate from the home continent, the better it will be for all of us and for future generations. So I really commend all of you as well. I know you're doing what you can in your countries, but I also know coming from a business background, communications is not given the attention and time it needs, but with a good comms and PR strategy, it can really elevate your business, share your story and have so much more impact than just profiting your company. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that contribution, Natalie. And I think that you've really highlighted something that is very important. To every one of us, we must understand that our voices can get to places that our physical presence cannot get to. Uh, so we need to lend our voice across whatever platforms that we can. Uh, and just like Natalie said, learn the art of communication because our voices can really, really make a difference. So praise, uh, you have the floor now. Right after praise, I'm going to take Pinky and then uh, uh, we, we, we move on from there. Praise, go ahead. Hey, hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And honestly, I've been really excited um, to get into the everyone's stuff on this. And so, Natalie actually um, you know, took the words right out of my mouth. Like, I was going to say something about sharing our story as Africans. 
for me, I believe that there are um, so many good things about Africa that uh, the world is yet to know about. So, like I just said, um, you know, when you think of China, you think of production, and then when you think of various other countries and the kind of things they are able to do, you know. So I feel like um, something that we can do as Africans, yeah, also leveraging technology and the digital um, space to actually tell the African story from a different light. There are so many things going on. It is really one thing to have a skill and people do not get to know about it. It is also one thing to have solutions to problems that are uh, doing. So many people across um, so many countries in Africa are yet to come to life with. So that's like something I just wanted to really put out there that um, beyond all of the solutions that we can bring, there is need to actually communicate those things and the world and change the perception, the strong and reliant perception of Africa being, um, you know, uh, poor or probably non productive. So that's like really what I wanted to address. Thank you very much, Chris, like for that. Thank you, thank you very, very much, Priest, for that. Uh, uh, very grateful for your contributions. And, and one of the things that I'm drawing from that is this. It falls upon us and our businesses and the things that we do with our businesses, the kind of products and services that we create to change the mindset. If you think about a mindset problem that Africa has, there is no one person that is responsible for it. The government can fix it. Right. So now that we've recognized it, it falls upon us to begin to work towards changing this by the very works of our own hands through the organizations that we lead. Uh, Pinky, you have the floor. Um, OK, I think I'm back. Yes. Um, I would just want to say that I also agree with the leaders. Um, and just to add to Sean's point, that we we need to actually reevaluate um, our level of trust as African um, countries, um, and when we have discovered the level that we at, um, and then start building that trust, because it, it's clear that we are trusting the international brand more than the African brand, and um, it all stems from the trust that we are trusting them um, over ourselves. And that also um, screams that we actually need to um, also dig deep and look at ourselves and actually see our own greatness and not wait for the international brands to actually recognize our greatness because it all starts with us. We need to see our greatness and actually advocate for each other so each country should have its own people that are advocating for them and as an african um, continent have ambassadors who are carrying bold um, voices and marry those voices with action massive action because right now i feel like yes um we have um, um, talks and we have conversations, but we need to actually now look into marrying those conversations with action and look into what needs to be done, um, what needs to be done to actually build that trust. Um, so yeah, and that um, I agree with you when you say that our voices are loud enough um, and that we should actually take pride in them and actually know that we can be heard and that we are heard. Um, we just need to be bold in what we believe in and um, stick to the core um, of what Africa is. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that contribution, Pinky. Uh, that, that is really good. So guys, well, until the final 30 minutes of this conversation, uh, let me just quickly also mention that uh, the summary of some of the ideas, thoughts, and solutions that have been discussed in this conversation will be sent to everyone by email. Uh, that's one. And then the second thing is um, this uh, stream has been recorded and I will ensure that it is, it is, it is going to premiere on YouTube tomorrow. So I'm going to uh, upload this session on YouTube. I'm going to send the link to every single one so that you, you can rewatch it if you want. And then you can also share with other people so that they can be a part of this conversation. Because whilst we're here, there are only about 20 to 23 of us, you know, in this conversation. Uh, there's so many uh, other people, young leaders like ourselves that are doing innovative things across the continent that need to be a part of this conversation. So they can get to watch and then leave their comments and then we can begin to expand it in that format. Now, as we begin to edge towards the end, uh, here's one of the things that I want us to address right now. This 
is a very practical solution based question that I'm going to ask you guys. So the conversation is centered around breaking down the barriers, you know, to transnational operations uh, across Africa. We have a lot of young people here today that have done amazing things, that are doing amazing things, that have shared amazing thoughts. And we all are from different countries. So everyone is going to take turns to answer this question. Now, here's the question. If we want to expand operations into your country, what are the advice that you, what advice would you give us? What are the things we should be mindful of? So I hope you do understand the question. So uh, take, for instance, Charles is at the top corner of my screen. So Charles, you will tell us uh, to all this African audience that is listening to you, if you want to expand into Nigeria, because I know Charles, you're in Nigeria, this is what you should be mindful of and this is what you should do. And then, you know, Bright will do the same thing. My Ngoni, we haven't heard from you, but I, 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 I saw you uh, active earlier. My, we hear from my, we hear from, we hear from every single person. Uh, so it doesn't matter if somebody has talked about your country, you give us your unique perspective. So the question is, if you, if everyone else here wants to expand into your country, what should we be mindful of? What should we know, right? Because one of the things that I've been highlighted earlier is there is no directory. There is no place where you have, you know, uh, harmonized information as to how you can expand into different countries. So uh, take note, everyone wants to expand into different countries. Uh, so Charles, we'll start with you. If we want to expand into your country, uh, tell us your country. And then if we want to expand, what should we be mindful of? Very quickly, guys, very quickly, not more than two minutes. Okay. Um, I'm from Nigeria. And I think the first advice I would give to you if you want to open a business in Nigeria is to understand your product and understand where you want to start from in Nigeria. Because like I said initially, Nigeria is a very huge place and we have about six geopolitical zones that are very, very diverse with respect to customer perception and customer behavior. So first you need to understand your product and it really doesn't matter who's within that category or the other products that are existing. You just need to understand your product and understand the market and do not create a product, do not bring a product from wherever you're bringing it from and try to force it down the throat of the market. You need to first understand that product, understand the market, and then find a way to either localize your communication or localize your product or localize your positioning. I think that would be the most important thing. Every other thing with respect to regulation and all of that, you can typically go online, learn about it, read about it. But with respect to the product positioning and the market you're getting into, that would be the first and the most important thing I would advise. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Charles. Bright, you're up next. And uh, right after Bright, I'm going to take my Ngoni. So Bright, you're up next. Bright, you're muted. You have to unmute. All right, I think Charles kind of just said everything because that's basically the basic thing that you have to do. But I, I, I would also advise that you um, identify a local partner who is already doing the same thing or similar thing and see how you can collaborate with them um, because they probably understand the user or the market behavior better. So um, definitely work with a local partner, whatever it is that you're doing. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bright. And those are perspectives from Nigeria. Mike Ngoni, uh, you're up next. Adil, I'm going to come to you right after mine. Hello, Mai, can you hear me? Okay, so Adio, you have the floor. Adio, please go ahead. After Adio, I'm gonna to come to Terence. Okay, so um, Sudan is a raw, it's a raw land. There's opportunities for investment. There's opportunities for uh, having relationships here. So if you, I would definitely advise if you want to uh, come and work here or, you know, bring a product um, is to uh, like, right, just that have a local partner. Um, make sure that you do a lot of uh, feasibility studies. Um, our, you know, the, the value of our currency is reducing every single day. So it would be also to keep in mind how much you want to price that product and um, what kind of category of citizens do you want to um, reach? You know, are you reaching middle class, upper class, or, you know, the, the working class? Um, but definitely um, there's, there's, there's a lot that can be done here. And uh, one of the main partners you might want to consider are the social enterprises that work with uh, small businesses uh, because they will help you position yourself properly in our market. 
Fantastic. So uh, I really love those perspectives. For Sudan, consider local partnerships. Uh, do your research in terms of feasibility and, and pricing, then partner with uh, social enterprises. Uh, so Terence, you're up next. Right after Terence, I'm going to take Pinky and I'll take Sean. Okay. Uh, in Zimbabwe, familiarity is very important. Uh, so um, if you're doing an advertising campaign, get local artists. Also, contracts are given to, you know, are tossed around people who know each other. So it's important to go out there and network. Uh, people like to do business with people whom they know. So you might have a fantastic product, but if you're going to just stay uh, behind locked doors, uh, you might, I mean, you may not be as successful. So you really need to go out there and meet people because people like to do business with people who they know. Uh, so generally, uh, that will give you uh, good mileage in Zimbabwe. Thank you very much for, for, for that, Terence. I mean, you talked about the fact that you need to build local networks uh, uh, and, you know, that would really, really go a long way in opening up Zimbabwe to you. Uh, Pinky, you are up next. Uh, after Pinky, I'll take Sean and then I'll take, um, I'll take Rativa. So, Pinky, please go ahead. Okay, um, for South Africa, um, I'll say the first thing is that you need to know your story. You need to believe in your product. You need to um, believe in your services as well that you are providing because um, that will allow you to be clear about your brand and for people to believe in your brand. Um, you need to um, be solving a problem or providing value um, because that's what South Africans love or that they're drawn to. Um, you need to be clear on your market as well, um, because you don't want to confuse um, who your product is, render, um, is for, um, and that you need to build relationships. Um, South Africans easily refer you to other people if they know and if they trust your brand. So build massive relationships. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that, Pinky. Uh, Sean, Sean, you're up next. And then uh, after Sean, I'll come to Ratiba and then I'll go to Natalie. Sean, you have the floor. Sean, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> so right now, our business is currently establishing itself in South Africa. And I feel like... Um, the lady before me uh, said everything that uh, I had to say about South Africa as well. Know your brand and make something that's uh, relatable in terms of your marketing material. But also we started in Zimbabwe. So let me also add to the, what we learned from uh, Zimbabwe as well. I would say in Zimbabwe, if you're starting a business, make sure that your supply chain is local. Not only to meet regulations or anything uh, in that regard, but because Zimbabwe has got a foreign currency issue. So you don't want to strain your foreign currency, access to your foreign currency to too many things to the point where you run out, where you can't even import uh, things to continue your business. So make sure you buy from local suppliers as much as you can. Yeah. Wow, that is very, very good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sean, for providing that perspective. Uh, Ratiba, please go right ahead. Um, after Ratiba, I will come to uh let's see Ratiba, go ahead i'll come to sukes right after Reti oh oh sorry natalie um right after Ratiba. please go ahead okay i think um they were already said some um, of the things um i think from from marketing perspective um you must you know educate the people about your brand you know brand awareness so whatever product that you're putting out there make sure that you educate you know your target market or the sector or the space that you're going to operate in so they must know like pinky has already said people buy into your story you know of why are you doing that you know the why in in, in the product that you're doing and the problem that you're solving which is literally a business this is just you know solving a problem so that's that you must you know be educate your 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 target market that you you um you are getting into you're selling the product to and obviously understand so i'll go back to localizing your product understand their cultures and whatever and how you can make it you know be part of their culture and so they can you know consider it and everything so and then it's easy for them to refer you 
because if one person buys it and is happy, the whole family is going to have it. Fantastic. And the whole family, the whole community is going to have it. And then you, you know, expand. You scale up. Thank you very much, Ratiba. Very important. Thank you very much, Ratiba. Um, so, Natalie, uh, you have the floor. Right after Natalie, I'll come to uh, Gift. And then after Gift, I will take Terence. Uh, Natalie, you have the floor. So, in Uganda, if you want to come and expand, I would suggest you find a local, we call them brokers or transaction advisors, because nothing gets done unless you know someone. It's so difficult to start companies, to get the right licenses. But the advantage is once you have someone local who helps you, whose profession it is to help you, you can get tax breaks, lots of advantages. They introduce you to the right network, the right market. It's easy to get up and running. We do have large Nigerian and Zimbabwean communities here, who people who've come to do one deal and they've never left because they enjoy it so much. And the good thing with Uganda is we have the fastest growing population in Africa now, which is kind of a gift and a curse at the same time. So we are growing really, really fast. There's so many young people, any sector that you want to work in, there are, there's market, there's like potential, there's so much growth that can happen. We're really just at the beginning from a business perspective as a, as a country. Fantastic, thank you very much for that. Uh, Natalie Gift, uh, you have the floor. Tell us about Malawi. Ah, okay. Uh, so for you to expand to Malawi, first of all, this is a light time to, for you. Uh, I think it's inviting investors to come to Malawi. And there is this uh, public, uh, public private partnership, which when you come and uh, there, there is a, a special authority which looks into that and they hope you, they'll guide you throughout the whole process on how you should register and to do everything. So the, the platform's there. So you can just go to their website, Public Partnership Malawi. Then from there, you'll be able to meet people who can help you and see to come and invest in Malawi and expand. But Malawi now is a, it's a good country to expand your business. So Malawi is open for business. Interesting. Uh, so Terence, uh, <laughs> right after Terence, uh, I'm going to take Maliha. So Terence, please uh, tell us about your country. <laughs> Davis, I spoke. Oh, I you spoke did already. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry. Uh, sorry. Maliha, yeah, please, sorry. you have the floor. Um, a lot of the points actually have been mentioned are, are things that I've also put down on my little paper. Um, I love the way that um, the gentleman from Malawi came on and said, you know, there is something that exists, which is a public and private partnership um, medium platform or a body that, you know, like, so there is easy collaboration. I think um, having the right kind of brokers that, that, that was mentioned by our sister here, that is also very important. Having the right teamwork, you know, to be able to advise you right from the start, you know, on what regulations need to be met, what your licensing is like for, for those that need it. Um, the other thing that I think that has not been touched and is quite important, I feel, is the background of the culture of the place that you want to expand to. Um, it would be pointless for somebody like me to want to do start up a pork um, factory, pork slaughter factory in a place like Egypt or Tunisia or Morocco, because predominantly the majority is Muslim. So uh, a background of their culture and their religion is also very important and it could help you to soar your business if you are mindful of that. Thank you um, very much. Apart, oh, apart go from ahead. The other things Yes, I think a lot of the other things have been mentioned. You know, there's the feasibility study that you need to do, which I think was a very, very vital point right from the, the, right from the word go. So um, I think um, some of the points that have been raised here are very enlightening, and I thank you all for this. Thank you. Thank you, Maliha. Um, Ray, uh, Ray, are you with us? Uh, I'll take Ray, and then right after Ray, I will take me B. Uh, we haven't heard from the person, but Ray, if you, if you can hear me, uh, please share perspectives uh, if you want to enter into your country. Um, thank you. Um, speaking for South Africa, I really echo a lot of what has been said regarding um, your building a local network. I think that's very important. Um, South Africa, from a regulatory perspective, um, is quite stringent on um, our BE laws. So that can be a gift and a curse. So I think that it's something to look into if you're gonna work with people who are like local. Um, another thing, I think someone spoke about adding genuine value and being very clear on your value proposition. I think um, 
in that as well, I think in, in whatever you do, um, be sure to also brand yourself very well. I think South Africa is notorious for loving the usual suspects. They're people who, um, they're very familiar. People who are doing it big always get the same opportunities. People will refer people they know, people they've worked with. So if you are seen to be doing, to be doing good, then um, you brand yourself while you communicate. Then I think, um, yeah, that, that's quite important. That's what I would add. Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, so uh, the two other perspectives I haven't taken is maybe an overshen. Uh, so maybe you have the floor. Um, okay, uh, overshen, uh, can you hear me? Hey, all good. I can hear you. Go right ahead, brother. Evening, everyone. Thanks for allowing me to chat. Um, yeah, so I'm from South Africa, and I think uh, what's important, or maybe not always known, is that South Africa has got three layers, a very distinct upper class, probably 2% of the population, a, a somewhat changing and topsy-turvy middle, and then a very gr disturbingly growing uh, bottom half. Um, that, that as it may, uh, I think as brands coming into, into the country, what product, no matter what product or service you're offering, I think it's, I, I echo what Ray was saying with regards to standing for something, um, offering, offering some kind of narrative, um, and also then just being authentic. Uh, yeah. That's Fantastic. Thank you very, yes. very much. Uh, please, if you have not shared your perspective and you'd like to share that now, please feel free to unmute your mic and go right ahead. Uh, I try to take perspectives from me, B, and uh, um, someone else earlier, but, you know, uh, they, they weren't coming on board. However, um, notwithstanding, uh, we're beginning to wrap up now. I, I just want to make uh, this announcement. So uh, a WhatsApp platform has been created uh, uh, to bring people together. So, Sukes, I see your hand. I'm going to come to you very shortly. Um, so, a WhatsApp platform has been created to bring us all together so that we can continue this conversation. Now, this African core conversation happens once a month. However, you know, as ideas pop up, innovations pop up, or, or collaboration opportunities, or any other form of opportunities pop up that you think uh, will be beneficial to this community of young leaders and you know, emerging you know, uh, leaders and innovators across the continent, please feel free uh, to share on that platform. So I'm going to be adding all of your numbers to the WhatsApp platform. If you would not want to be a part of that, please send me a private message uh, so that I know and I do not do that. But otherwise, I'm going to be adding everybody by default to that WhatsApp platform and we can continue the African conversation on those platforms. Oh, oh yeah, so uh, uh, Sukes, before we come to you, we haven't taken Praise's perspective on, you know, uh, Nigeria. So Praise, please go ahead. I'm going to come to you, Sukes, right after. Hello, Praise. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So I can hear Praise, but uh, Sukes, uh, gift. Please go ahead. Ah, uh, okay. So. Uh, so guys, I just, I just want to take this opportunity to let you know that uh, I've done uh, my first feature film, which is supposed to be out in December, but probably will shift your time. So I'm looking for partners to premiere in uh, different countries. So far, we're working in Zambia, uh, premiere in Zambia and South Africa, but I want to expand to other countries. Can let it be Nigeria and uh, other countries. So if you want maybe to work stuff maybe on the group, I'll be able to 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 talk and maybe to try to do a partnership and see how best we can work together. Fantastic, Shop. fantastic gift. And that is actually the notes that I wanted us to end on. I wanted everybody to share, you know, uh, what their objectives are, what their next set of goals are, uh, and because again. When we all know what everybody wants, it is easy to channel you know, opportunities and information to each other. So um, please, uh, if, if you want to talk about what you're doing, what your goals are, what your objectives are, please uh, feel free to unmute your mic uh, and, and then just go uh, uh, and talk about that very quickly. So Sean, I see your hand. Sean, you could go right ahead. Hey, Davis. Okay. Um... 
Wait, hold on. Just one second. How do I turn this video on? Okay. I actually don't want to turn the video on. I want to share my screen. Okay. Are you able to allow me to share your screen? Um, yes, I can. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I, can, can I share my screen? Yes, you can share your screen. Go ahead. It says, it says you're supposed to approve it. Uh, I'm sure it says disabled. Uh, okay, I'm going to try to fix that. I'll, I'll, I'll look through the settings to see if I can fix that really quickly. Uh, but Ratiba, okay. I think I saw your hand. So I'm going to come back to you, Sean. I'm going to try to see if All I right. can, you know, uh, activate uh, you right. to share your screen. So Ratiba, please go ahead and share with us what it is that you're working with so that, you know, if we have this to support you with, we can go right ahead. Um, for me, I wanted like you asked me in the beginning like the progress from the previous meeting um recently i've been working with an organization called windows of heaven foundation we'll be launching um a pilot leadership program online um we're trying to test out different systems um as to how can we best operate it and we're dealing with kids from um age of 12 up until 20 so we're teaching them leadership um, from a young age and the project mostly is based on um, we're going to educate them and then after that we're going to ask them to find a specific problem in their community and work around implementation plan and you know and the solution to that problem and then we connect them to um, different people in different stakeholders to actually action the, the, the solutions of that problem in their community mm -hmm. so that's basically what we're busy with we fantastic next month so maybe in terms of technology, advices on what we can use um, to those people who are in the tech space um, in all that so we can see how we can you know, work around that. Thank you very much, Ratiba. Uh, and your voice is heard. I'm sure that uh, people who, who are interested in that or is, is a, are able to help will reach out. Sean, you can try again now. So I made a couple of changes. Uh, Sean, can you try, right. try again now? Yeah. Let me give it a try. Yep, seems to be working. Fantastic. All right. So this is one of the, okay, firstly, sorry. So our brand is called uh, Simba Solutions and we develop mobile applications, desktop apps, you know, we do marketing strategies, we develop mobile games and et cetera. But currently we're working on a mobile application and desktop app called Learnable. This is the education startup that we're currently busy with at the moment and we're almost done with it. So we're looking for partners that can help us sort of like scale this throughout Africa. We don't intend to be physically present in every single country on the continent, but we want to have partners that we can sort of like leverage off their, uh, their, their, their influence in their markets to scale it up through the rest of Africa. And also to add on to what we were saying earlier about creating a superior product, we spent the past couple of months uh, working on this because we came into the education space only to find out that look everyone else has got an LMS or some sort of e-learning platform you know every other company has come up with one <clears throat> but we wanted to work on something that's actually better and more superior to entice people to say look we have this but this is way better than what we're already using so it says just some of the features that the platform already does and it also allows you to create augmented reality uh, lessons that you can push onto a mobile device uh, straight from from the desktop app, add annotations, you know, add notes, whatever it may be, and your learners can actually see it in in real time uh, remotely. So that's what we're working on right now. We're looking for partners and people that have access to partners, maybe to help us uh, scale this. You know, go as far as we can with this. Fantastic. Um, thank you yeah. very much, Sean. Uh, and I think that what you're working on is, is really important and very, very innovative. Uh, I actually have a conversation series that I occasionally host on Instagram called uh, Talking Innovation with Davis. And uh, it, would be, it would be great to have you to talk about, you know, your innovation that you're working on on Instagram. But again, we'll, okay. we'll carry that conversation forward uh, uh, on the WhatsApp platform. Uh, so we've got just a couple of minutes to wrap up. Does anybody else want to share uh, you know, what they're working on, you know, uh, try to garner support uh, within the community. Please feel free to unmute your mic right about now and just go ahead. Okay, anyone else? Natalie? Um, I'll, I'll share a link in the group, but 
One of my companies is called Her, and it's a mentorship platform for African women where we share content and lessons that will help them to grow their businesses and their careers. I'll send you all a link, and I would really appreciate it if you could circulate that in your countries because we do like to have women from all over Africa. We have women from... What? Pardon? Ne never mind. Uh, my, my teenager just walked... Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll share the link, but I would really appreciate that because it's still quite early. We've only been doing this for about a year, but okay. finally we've opened up more than just Uganda and it's been so great to have women from all over the continent and hear their stories and share in our learning. So I'd appreciate that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, we will look forward to the link in the group. Um, so Maliha, I, you wanted to say something? Um, I, I did. Um, okay, go ahead. I, I apologize for, for the intrusion. It's all right. <laughs> um, the, I, I don't have much to, I, I would like to uh, have a sort of a summary on what we've discussed here. One of the keynotes that I, I think that, you know, feel that is very important for us to all maybe go back and think about how we could explore and take this to the next level is the interaction between countries. We know we talked about these big bodies, you know, we talked about the OAU and we talked about the COMESA and everything like that. But I think at a, on a, at the grassroots level, we need to start um, individually in, in, in the numbers that we have. You know, we've all come together, um, given up a portion of our Saturday night, and, and here we are, we're talking. I, I, I feel that, you know, right now the ball for it to get rolling is that we need a little bit more definite um, ideas that are going to be coming together to bridge that get and gap and making the interaction between us possible at the soonest. Definitely, uh, definitely, Malika. And, you know, just like you said, these are thoughts uh, that we have and we will continue to uh, explore some of the stuff. Now, let me, let me assure you that the key ideas, thoughts, and conversations uh, uh, that has been shared on this platform today uh, will be made available to you. So we're going to do like a, a, a summary, a summarized report uh, of all of these things that we're going to send to every single person uh, via email, and we're also going to share it in the WhatsApp group. So, uh, Malia, we got you covered in that regard. Now, I just discovered that, you know, I, I didn't talk about myself at any point. So, uh, just in case you're wondering, uh, um, so I run a couple of organizations myself. Uh, I run a consultant business in Nigeria called uh, Enterprise Hill, where we help small businesses build structures within their business so that they can grow and scale. And then I also run a social enterprise called Competence Africa. You can check out Competence Africa and some of the feedback and the amazing work that we do on LinkedIn. So just go on LinkedIn, search for Competence Africa. Essentially, the mission of Competence Africa is to improve the quality of Africa's human capital. So we do deal a lot with helping young people build competencies and skills and the rest of that. But I'm sure that, you know, with the WhatsApp platform, we're going to have more interaction. A couple of our friends have left us already, but for every single one of us, that joined in this conversation today. I want to celebrate you all, to appreciate you, to thank you for the leadership that you provide, for the innovation that you lead, and for your heart for the development of Africa. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, so at this time, I'd like everybody to unmute, show your videos, and you know, let's just you know put our hands together for Africa and for every one of us. Uh, so please unmute, show your videos. Uh, let's see your faces. Yay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> thank you so much it has thank been a so very much. very thank good you. time you, you all so are welcome thank so thank i'm you. gonna add everybody you to guys. yeah yeah thank you so much guys thank you so much guys i'm gonna add you all to the group and then we can carry on the conversation uh uh from that uh we're gonna have the timeline for the next uh conversation actual conversation over zoom uh which is going to be next month is also going to be communicated by the group and lastly this video recording, this video has been recorded, so it is going to premiere on YouTube tomorrow uh, by 4 p.m. So I'm going to ensure that it's on YouTube. It's going to premiere by 4 p.m. tomorrow. I'm going to send the link to you guys so you can share with your network on social media and, uh, you know, so that other people as well can watch the conversation we've had and also be a part of it. Thank you very much, guys. It has been Thank my you. pleasure Thank to you. have you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, so Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Stay safe. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.